Grab your pre-workout and turn up that volume. It is time for a new episode of The Powerlifter's Den with your host, Cam Smith. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Powerlifter's Den. Um, today, I wanted to bring on a guest all the way up from the North Pole, uh, also known as Big Bad Santa. Uh, uh, apparently, he does some strongman as well. Why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> I'm Albie Machaney. Uh I call Oregon home during the year, but North Pole is where I get all my work done. Awesome. So I guess to kind of start off, um, I know you, you have done Strongman. I guess what kind of got you into that? When did you start doing that? And um, how long have you been doing it for? Well, um, I actually came up in powerlifting in the 90s. Um, I was coached by the great uh, Doyle Kennedy, two-time IPF world champion, and kind of tested the waters um, in powerlifting and set a few records. And then uh, some years later, my gym, uh, Gold's Gym, Salem, Oregon, put on the Oregon State uh, Strongman Championship at a summer festival. And I thought I'd give it a shot and did my first contest in 1999. And uh, that's where I met my best friend, Mike Cromer. And uh, the year after that, I did a contest and then took about 15 years off to raise a family. And um, let's see, nine years ago this month, uh, my youngest son was born and I had put on quite a bit of weight in those 15 years. And I was sitting on the floor at about 415 pounds and uh, my kids were having to help me put my shoes and socks on. And then I made the realization that at 42 years old, I was going to be 60 when he graduated high school. So I thought I better get in shape. And so I started training and, you know, kind of, kind of decided that I was going to be the world's strongest Santa. And my first contest, I got my ass whooped. And then, and then, uh, Mike Cromer reached out to me after all those years and he goes, Hey, I, uh, I saw you got your ass whipped. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Still sore about it. He goes, I could write you a program and that shit will never happen again. And he did. And, you know, ass kickings are few and far between anymore. You know, it, it, I took third at a national qualifier in Primeville, Oregon, big show. And then my first year at the Olympia uh, for Strongman Corp, I took third, uh, kind of shocking the world and put my name on the map. And, and it's just skyrocketed from there. That's awesome. Yeah, Strongman's always been something I've been uh, pretty interested in, but I haven't yet to compete in it. Um, just because like, I feel like with my football background, like I, I feel like I do pretty well in it, but um, it's always fun yeah. to watch. It's like a, it's, I'd consider it like a performance sport because you get, obviously you put on a show, you get to do these crazy movements and at the end of the day, you get to show your strength. So um, I guess from the, the transition from powerlifting to strongman, what are some of the, the biggest things you've taken away from powerlifting that have translated? Well, if, if I could roll back the clock and change one thing, it would have been, um, training overhead press all those years ago because powerlifters typically it's an accessory and it doesn't get a lot of attention and I should have paid a lot more attention to it back in the day. Um, but as far as the transition, it was like, like it was refreshing. Powerlifting became pretty boring to me. Um, and, and the sport is amazing for what it is, but if you're the kind of person that really likes to press himself, you know, you're only ever going to get so strong at a bench squat and deadlift. Um, but, you know, maybe you're a great yoke uh, runner or maybe you're a great farmer's carry. And it's like, you know, when you're in powerlifting, so many people are better at the squat than the deadlift or vice versa, the deadlift specialist. But you really only have three shots to prove to the entire audience that you're the man. Well, in a strongman competition, you get five events typically, an overhead couple of moving events, a deadlift, you know, a pulling event, that kind of thing, you know, so when you stand at the top of that podium at the end of the day, you know that you're the baddest dude there, and so it's it's more of a challenge to me, um, and I just love it. I, I, I love the fact that at 50 years old, I can still pick up stuff and move it. Well, not right this second. I'm recovering from knee surgery, but, you know, prior to a couple of months ago, I felt like the man. Yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah, exactly. Especially at 50 years old. Some people aren't even working out, exercising in general, and you're still lifting these heavy ass weights. Um, I guess with all the events, I know there's the medleys and they're big on pressing and deadlift, obviously. I guess what is your um, what is your specialty or like your favorite? So 
I, like my specialties have kind of changed over the years. Um, I've always been pretty good statically. Uh, my coach is an amazing overhead presser, probably the premier masters overhead presser in the country. Um, he's got an out of the rack log press, uh, personal best at 455 pounds. Jesus. And he did that at about 46 years of age. <laughs> We're both 50 by about a week apart. And so I've always had a pretty good overhead, um, coming up from Doyle Kennedy. I've always had a really good deadlift. My one rep max in a contest, two different times I've pulled 728. Um, but I'm most known for being able to do reps. Um, I think about five times I've pulled over 600 pounds, 10 or more reps in a contest. And so it's uh, at the national rec level, I'm rarely beaten at the deadline. That's it's cool. happened. It happened this year at nationals, and I was a bit shocked. I was, I was, that kind of lit the fire to finish the day strong, but I got bested by one rep and I was like, my hat was off to that dude. He, he, you know, I hit 475 for 17 reps and he was able to get 18. Oh, wow. But, you know, yeah. But, you know, I, I turned it around, focused all that energy on everything else and ended up finishing the day at the top of the podium and had a great day. That's awesome. So I guess with the, the deadlift, like obviously between powerlifting strongman, there there are some wildly different movements. Like you, you're allowed to use, uh, suits and straps and you can hitch and ramp, I guess. Um, I mean, you don't necessarily see it all the time, but I guess what, how, how, how was that difference for you? Like, did it help you? Did it so, not make much of a difference or? So I actually have a really good grip. Um, but I always save my hands for my grip of things, you know, so it's all about using all the tools you're allowed. Um, I've never been comfortable in a deadlift suit and have never used one in a contest. I actually used my deadlift suit in a squat contest um, last year at the uh, Masters Clash in Columbia. Um, but as far as that straps, you know, it's it's use the tools you're allowed to use. Um, I've never been caught on film hitching. <laughs> you know, I just, you know, when you, when you learn how to deadlift from one of the greatest deadlifters in history, um, you know, I, I take my deadlift form pretty seriously. Yeah. Um, so I never hitch and I've just never been able to make a suit work. I would love to be able to put a hundred pounds on my deadlift by making a suit work, but yeah, you know, it's just too fat to breathe, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and most of the time in a strongman contest, it's going to be repetitions. Yeah, you know, so it's rare that you have a one rep max, and so you know if you're wearing a suit and you can't breathe, you're not going to get a lot of reps. So yeah, I I try to I try to train how I compete. Yeah. So I guess over the years, what are, what are some of the competitions that you've done or maybe some of your favorite? Um, so one of my, one of my favorite crowning achievements was 2017. I competed in the static monsters worldwide global event. And I actually won. I beat all the other masters in the whole planet. Um, and it came down to the very last poll. And I knew that I had to pull an 815 to beat my coach who had like a 50 pound lead on me uh, after the press. And because I was doing it in um, Fairbanks, Alaska, I was an hour uh, after him. So I knew what I had to beat. And so I think I finished that day with like a 330 log press and a 815 axle deadlift. And then when they tallied it all up, I had beaten 80 other masters from 20 other countries. That's awesome. And so I was very proud of that. And I, and because of that, I got to, I got invited to static monsters worlds in Australia, but they didn't have a master's class. So I was competing with guys in the twenties and thirties and I finished seventh in Australia in an open class. Contest. So I, I was pretty proud of that. And then, um, I've competed at OSG four, four or five times. Um, my best finish was 16. It was like the older I got, the younger my competitors got, and it got tough. And I really had my heart set on making a good showing this year in my first year in the 50 class, but then tore my patella and broke my kneecap a couple of months back. Um, and my other like most proud moment is winning 50-plus uh, Masters Nationals at Dallas this year for the USS. And, and I won that uh, with a 10-point lead. So I, I, I had a good contest that day. And then finished third at the um, inaugural uh, Pro Strongman League Masters 
uh, championship in Columbia, Ohio. And I finished behind my coach and uh, big George Pearson, who finished on the podium at OSG the year before. So I felt pretty good about that day, too. Yeah. So I guess kind of more into the the whole Santa thing, uh, maybe where did that start? Or like, when did that kind of become like, I guess, your brand? So that's a good question. And um, No Shave November kind of carried over into December. My wife had always liked me to have a nice tight goatee. So I started growing out the beard. And coincidentally, about the time I decided to launch the comeback, she was getting into watching Duck Dynasty a lot. And so she she greenlit growing the beard. And I was like, okay. And then when I started the comeback, I, I walked in blind. Like, it's been 15 years since I trained regular. And so I started, you know, YouTube and videos and stuff on how to get started. And, and I wanted to, I knew what I was attempting was going to be special. You know, because going from a body weight of 415 and then just deciding you're going to compete, I knew I wanted to keep myself honest. So I did a YouTube search on how to be successful at fitness. And this was before the term influencer came up. And I found a video by the late, great Rich Piana. And he said, in order to be successful, he said, people will train their whole life trying to win a trophy and may or may not ever win the trophy, but they end up broke working at the gym they used to own. Yeah. And he said, you have to build your brand. He goes, in order to do that, you have to give the public something they're not getting and be better at it than everybody else. And I thought, what do I have? What? I was like, oh, I'll be the world's strongest Santa. So I owe this whole gimmick to, to Rich Piana. And then it just went crazy. Yeah. I did my first contest with a T-shirt on that looked like a Santa suit. <laughs> and every kid wanted their picture. And then I knew right then I was up. That's awesome. And then it went real crazy. Like videos got shared videos guy started getting paid for a few videos and then tv shows and it's it's been wild yeah i remember like a few years back that just i think it was just a deadlift video of like look at santa pulling blah 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 and it was like okay that's that's awesome like that's i love that bit um i so i guess kind of more diving into it do you do like i said you mentioned you a tv show like do you do like go around the christmas season and doing like the whole santa thing too so I usually do have, uh, I'm usually really busy, uh, but this year with the knee being busted up, I just didn't like, I wasn't going to be able to put a hundred percent into it. And so I didn't book many uh, paid jobs. I just did. Uh, I'm doing my three volunteer ones that I, that I do every year. One was at the gym where we do a toy drive for um, the local uh, child protective services. So kids that have been taken from homes and placed in foster homes and making sure that they get a good Christmas. And then the next is at the Evergreen Air Museum. Inside of the Spruce Goose, I get to sit in this huge throne that they've made for pictures. And it's just, it's magical. And then uh, my employer, they're having their Christmas party for uh, residents, a, a maintenance man at an apartment complex. And I'm going to surprise everybody and show up there because I haven't been to work in a couple of months because of the move. So yeah. I just did, did three volunteer ones, you know, just because it's, it's, they're my favorite ones to do anyway. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Like, I mean, that's a really cool setup too. The, the whole big, that's a big ass plane too, isn't it? Dude, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely cool. I have a friend of mine who's the lead restoration mechanic at the museum and, and he's been real good to me. I got the, I got to see the entire inner workings of the museum after hours and, you know, you get to, you know, actually cross the rope and be underneath the planes and check them out. And yeah, and then I'm kind of a military history nerd. And so to be around some of those planes, I was like, I was like a little kid. Yeah. I was more excited than my kids were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, another thing too, at the, uh, do you feel like around Christmas time, like you get, you see a lot of your old videos and stuff getting like reposted or maybe your, your posts getting more like engagement and stuff? I, I It hasn't been as wild this year just because I haven't promoted a lot, but every once in a while, someone will send me a video that like some news channel has posted that they rehashed from the year before or something. And, you know, and it's, it's nice. Like, and my TV show was just, uh, re-released on HBO Max. So I had a bunch of friends going, dude, you're on HBO now. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I should probably check and see if I've got some money coming to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to get that royalty check, man. <laughs> yep, yep. So um, maybe going into your injury a little bit about, you said you tore your patella. Um, kind of how did that happen? And what's the, what's the recovery been like so far? 
Well, um, I was all set. So after nationals, uh, when, when I won nationals, this is where my ego is. The year before every class got this huge championship belt. And I was like, I'm going to win one of those one day. And so I win nationals and I go up to the trophy table and I'm like, Hey, can I see my belt? And they're like, Oh, were you in an open class? I was like, no, no masters 50 plus. They're like, Oh, you didn't win a belt. You won one of these. And it's literally a, looks like a, a, a weightlifting plate, but it's concrete. And it says USS Nats 2023. It doesn't even say first place or national champion. And I was a little bummed. And they said, well, if you want to win a belt, you got to do pro masters worlds down in Phoenix. Well, I love Phoenix. So I signed up immediately, paid for my trip and everything. Well, the week before, the promoter, who had done nothing to get ready for this contest, canceled it. Oh, wow. But the state rep said, well, if you're coming down here anyway, come by the gym. We'll put on a mock meet so that way you know, you're not wasting your trip. I said, okay. So I go down there. The very first event, we set up the press medley. I banged through the, the block. Hit the 135 pound sigros dumbbell, 225 axle press, pull up a 265 pound log, which is typically warm up weight. Like I can viper press that. I pull it up, get set, dip to press. And when I go to press, my kneecap separated from itself. My patella tendon had basically pulled a chunk of my kneecap off. And as it retracted down my leg, it tore the reticulum uh, medial and lateral. So your patella tendon has tendons connected to it. Yeah. It shredded all and all of that. Damn. And as I fell, the log landed on what was left of my knee, uh, giving me a bone bruise on my femur. And the doctor was like, if your bone density wasn't like concrete, you could have very well broken that knot off of the end of your uh, femur. And so as it turned out, <laughs> the surgery, the surgeons came up to me afterwards and they said, Is you're incredible. I go, what do you mean? He goes, your bone density is such that we literally just stretched what was left of your kneecap up and screwed it back into itself and then ran anchors from your femur through your kneecap and then laced everything back together. He goes, we were basically sewing spaghetti. And he said, but you went right back together. And so I, I was nervous at first. I was like, you know, if this is it, I went out on a good year. I had a couple of good shows. And if this is the end of the career, then I'm walking away with my head up. But then two weeks later, I stopped wearing the brace. And uh, a week after that, I stopped using the crutches. And three days after that, I stopped using the cane. I've been walking around on it, you know, since about three and a half weeks after surgery. Um, started physical therapy with 84 degrees of movement. And within an hour, we were at uh, 98. We had gained 14 degrees in an hour. Awesome. And so, yeah, I, I'm just real encouraged about the comeback. I, I, I'm hoping that Lynn um, from uh, OSG will extend my um, invite to next year. And so that way I don't have to go through the, the pain in the ass of uh, qualifying when I'm not ready. Yep. So that I can work the entire year to possibly get back to OSG. So. I, I think I've got some unfinished business. I know I've got a better finish in me at Worlds, and so that's the goal. Oh yeah, I know it's it's kind of crazy when you hear of like like these very strong people, like top level powerlifters, strong men, stuff going through these types of injuries that like a normal person would be either on a, in a brace for the rest of their life or always limping or something. Like the, our bone densities are just so high. Like you, like uh, yeah. one of my friends just had uh, shoulder surgery on his labrum back in April. And he said when they, they had to use bigger pins because <clears throat> his bone density was so strong that it was breaking the smaller pins. And like, you see these people recovering so quickly and it's like, if that's not a case to prove it, why everyone should be lifting heavy ass weights, then I don't know what is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it takes a special person to put themselves through this. Like two years ago at worlds, I tore my peg just, on a 325 log, when I brought it down, it just pulled my uh, pec major right off the bicep bump. And I finished the contest. And when I got that repaired, they said that it had retracted seven and a half inches. And they had two people pulling on it to pull it up. And then another person pushing down to hold it when they lagged it down. And uh, within five months of having that surgery, I was back to hitting sets of five at 365. There we go. And on the bench. And so it, uh, 
you know, if you follow the steps, you follow everything your personal or your uh, physical therapist says, you know, because that's what's important, not trying to overdo it and everything. And I followed everything by the book and my body reacted really well and, and I recovered real well. So hopefully it goes like this again and, and I'll be back. Yeah, I'm hoping to get a great recovery too. And so with, so I got my master's in biomedical engineering this year and um, we, I did, took a lot. Congratulations, long, you. Thank you. And we, I took a few classes on um, orthopedics and stuff. So I got to watch a lot of orthopedic videos. And so I don't know if you've ever seen any, but they're like very like violent, like surgeries, yeah. like using like jackhammers and like power tools. <laughs> so I can only imagine for someone like with crazy bone density and like muscle density, like what kind of tools and torque they need to find to get them yeah. back in place. <laughs> and it was funny too, because after I had my pec done, it wasn't until I got home and I'm sitting there with a the nerve lock in that I finally go onto YouTube and watch what surgery I just had. Like I avoided that beforehand. And so, and then my surgeon's like, there's a, the exact video on YouTube of what I did to you. He goes, here it is. You can watch it when you want. I'm like, okay, I haven't gotten up the nerve to watch it yet. Yeah. Cause I know it's going to be healthy, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's amazing. I'm so thankful that, you know, people have that knowledge and they're able to do that. You know, I, and I, and I told him, I said, I said, my goal is to be your greatest surgical success story. And he goes, all right. He goes, it's on. Yeah. Show me what you got. I'm like, okay. He goes, but go slow. <laughs> I said, okay. Yeah. So I guess more into the actual training side of things, kind of, I guess maybe in off season versus like kind of meat prep. I mean, obviously it's different than powerlifting. How, how is that usually kind of structured for you? Um, anymore, like the older I got, it took me quite a while to realize that, um, and, and I actually took this advice from Mark Felix cause I was listening to him talk. Um, when he's training for worlds, he said he seldom gets over like 80, 85%. And then, when he's in the off season, it's 65, 70%. And so I was like, okay, you know, cause I've already established like every gym I train at in town here, there's two of them. They all know me. So it's not like I have to put six wheels on the deadlift and bang out reps to let everybody know who I am. Yeah. Like they already know. I don't, I, I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I can check the ego at the door. You know, if they need proof, I can find a video, but you know, I, I, I had to, you know, park the ego and just train smart now. And, you know, I do a lot more volume now than I used to, which has been kind of amazing because in the contest that I've done, I've actually fared really well on the moving events, which, excuse me again, I've never thought of myself as very athletic. I've always thought of myself as powerful. But my coach and I were the only two to finish the medley at the um, Pro Strongman League uh, contest in Columbia. And it was a, I think, 275 each hand farmers down and back, like 50 feet down, 50 feet back, and then a 700 pound yoke down and back. And we were we were the only two to finish. He actually beat me, you know, he, his pudgy little legs were moving pretty quick. But, you know, to, for me to finish that, it was it was a pretty big feather in my cap for the day, you know, because I've never, never thought of myself as a, a moving event guy, but. Farmer's carries are my jam and I'm okay with the yoke. And so yeah, I just, I embrace what my body allows me to do. Yeah. You know, my favorite event is the one that I can finish. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like in strongman too, there's, there's usually, I mean, you have like your two types, you have your, your static monsters and then you have like your medley guys. And I feel like, I don't know if how this usually goes, if it's kind of, you know, you're a static guy and you just roll with it or you just try to kind of be yeah. the best hybrid you can be. Well, and, and I've evolved to the point where, like, on the days that I, I, I train and, and do events, on the events that I know I'm good at, I don't hit as hard. But on events that I know I need help with, I put in extra reps, you know, get in a lot of extra volume. And I think that's helped. Like, and, and training at my age, I know that I'm going to have to, like, allow for some extra time to recover. So I can't heavy deadlift two weeks in a row yeah. anymore. Like, it's one heavy week and then the next week's maybe a volume week. Um, but it's usually, you know, four Oh five for reps instead of four ninety five. you know, that kind of thing. And it's, and it's not a huge difference. It's just that, you know, 
evolving and listening to your body because you know there's those people out there that just go 110 percent all the time and it's like you've been in the game long enough you're just waiting for that ticking time bomb to go off and and you know you want to warn them but then you don't want to get blasted on social media for being the first who volunteers information it's like okay go fuck yourself up yeah. and <laughs> I can give you advice on how to fix yourself afterwards too, because I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see it in powerlifting too. I mean, we call them flash in the pans, where someone comes out, they're like, "Whoa, this guy's going to be great," and then next thing you know, they're off yeah. the face of the planet because they're just going balls to the wall every day for months without deloading or recovering, yeah. and then they end up blowing a pec off or tearing their ACL or something crazy. Yeah, and that's one of the cool things. Like you'll you'll find if you ever go to a a, a big contest. Find the masters lifters and kick it with them. Cause one, we're funny. Holy shit. We're having a good time. And, and we're just salty old bastards that are just funny and cracking jokes. But you know, anything that comes up, any one of us has some kind of trick to fix it. Like I always dealt with patella uh, tendonitis and everybody rubs the patella, you know, in that spot, or they try to loosen up their quad thinking it, well, almost all of my patella pain came from my hamstring. So sitting on a lacrosse ball or two lacrosse balls taped together, it looked like a ball sack and rolling it from my knee to my glute back and forth was like medicine and gave me the most relief for my knee. Well, you take some young buck that's just strong as shit. He's not going to know that, Yeah. you know, and then he's going to suffer needlessly because, you know, one, he either doesn't, ask or put it out there that this is bugging him and stuff but there are so many tricks to this and it's like if you want to know them hang out with the old farts because <laughs> they know it yeah so um i know you've done multiple competitions and stuff and you mentioned your coach and all that uh, maybe <clears throat> maybe who are some of the other influences or maybe like role models you had kind of getting into the sport so back in the day when i watched um strong man uh, years ago i used to love to watch the daddy glenn ross because he was the fattest <laughs> competitor and i was like that's my guy like i can relate to that guy because you know you can tell when he ties his shoes that's tied on the side he ain't getting all the way down there right or he's just sliding them shits on and i was like oh, i love that guy and he was just so powerful and a lot of people don't realize even though he didn't that, do that well at worlds he was very powerful um, I think he was a record holder in a press and a deadlift for a while, eight or nine time Europe's strongest man, like just dominated uh, Europe for, you know, the better part of a decade. Um, of course, Bill Kazmaier, uh, personal friend, because him and Doyle Kennedy used to compete against each other. And I reached out to him and we just started shooting the shit. And uh, it turns out he's a good dude. Um, he offered me to stay at his place when I visited Alaska. He's a great guy. And then, like truly the greatest strength athlete that's ever walked this planet is Adrenus Sivicus. Like he's been at this 30 years now. Like he started, I think when he was 16 and I think he's 47 or 48 now and just dominating still. Like the fact that he still competes and still is like the man wherever he goes, it's just, it's a testament, you know, and all that came after all his Arnold wins, all his World's Strongest Man wins came after blowing both his patellas and a Conan's wheel mat, uh, uh, injury. Wow. So, yeah, he, he had those fixed, and then he went on to do all that dominating. So that gives me uh, encouragement. That's crazy. So, and, as far, and, and as far as, like, modern-day stuff, you can't you, – you just can't say enough good things about Brian Shaw. Yeah. I've got to hang out with him and his wife uh, a couple of times at contests. And just great, incredible people. Uh, so knowledgeable and just so ingratiating like you tell him a story and he'll stand there and listen to it like you know you're giving him the the cure to cancer like he is just that genuinely cool and and concerned about people so yeah it's just just some amazing folks out there yeah i mean the strong the sport of strong man just seems like a very um friendly sport like obviously you have these big old mass monsters but they're big old teddy bears most of the time oh yeah yeah, you walk up to you walk up to the scariest guy in the place with a rice crispy treat and offer it. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, like like if they well one if they didn't turn it down, you know there's something wrong because 
like Nathan Payton, I, uh, I got some tr- nutritional coaching from him. And like on game day, it's, it's Uncrustables, um, Rice Krispie Treats, and oranges. You know, eat, eat one of each in between each event. You know, so you can always spot the people who have had Nathan coaching them because they've got a whole box <laughs> full of Rice Krispie Treats. That's funny. <laughs> so if you could um, like maybe pick one event that you could just immediately get rid of from any competition, what would you say? Stones. Yeah. <laughs> Stones. Stones. Yeah. I call them the devil's, I call them the devil's testicles. <laughs> Fuck those things. I can't stand. Well, I've always had a bigger gut than I had long arms. Yeah. And so I've never, I've never been awesome at them. I can, I can fare. Okay. And in front of my house, I have 17 of them laid out uh, from 100 pounds up to 335 pounds or 350 pounds. But God, I hate them shits. Like if I could get rid of that and well, and there's dumb events, but like for that one to be the mainstay that's yeah. in like every big contest, I'd shit for that. Yeah. So I, I, what's your best zone? Uh, 355 for a double. Yeah. And that was in a, in a contest to qualify to go to the Olympia in 2000. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I would assume that stones overall are more people that are taller. Do you, do you see that translation mostly? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You got to have the leverages. You got to have the flexibility. Like my hips are so bound up and and tight that just getting under, you know, just to get my hips low enough to where I can get my hands underneath it is hard. And then, you know, I I've always fancied myself a good hugger, but you know, getting a hold of those things and hanging on to them, like, like Kazmaier said, uh, he he clowns on people for gluing themselves to the stones. Well, I have to. Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't for tacky, if it wasn't for tacky, I I wouldn't be able to move any of them. It, it, it sucks. Yeah. It's just, and and I should probably do it more. Like I literally have no reason not to, other than my knee right now. They're literally right outside my front door. And <laughs> I mean, in, in fact, in fact, it's funny. I've got a I've got a thing set up, a tire. And people come up when whenever there's a delivery guy that comes up to the door and he goes, "Do you lift those?" And I was like, "Yeah, why the fuck else would I have them?" So yeah, I mean, the the thing with the stones too that sucks is like obviously the heavier get the the bigger they get too, so the leverage doesn't go down and down even more. So I can only imagine once yeah. it starts get like, I just I mean, what does the stones usually range from at like most competitions? I think they're twenty and twenty two inches um, diameter. I think. I think the ones that um, um, the uh, oh what the hell the Stoltmans uh, lifted for their world record were bigger, um, but for the most part they're twenty and twenty two inches. I think. Yeah. So kind of with going through the recovery, um, I'm assuming now that things are starting to go well, you're probably starting to look for your next competition. When do you? What are your plans for that? Well. Um, OSG for sure. That's the that's the huge goal, the ultimate goal. But um, I'm still off. It's my nine year old, and so. Uh, but uh, Chad Coy just put out the dates for the Pro Strongman League Masters Championship that he puts on every year, um, and it's the end of July. And so my coach is like, "That's your comeback show," and I'm like. My doctor says I'm not going to have full range of motion till April, and you want me to be ready for a show by July? And he goes, "Don't be a pussy." I'm like, okay, <laughs> noted. <laughs> so, so um, I guess with the strongman events and like kind of signing up for one, like with piloting meet, you obviously know what you're getting into, and usually yeah. preps are anywhere from like eight to like up to sixteen. I guess generally speaking, what do you kind of see as the most common like length of a strongman comp and kind of when do you know what the events are going to be well usually when they make the announcement that they're going to put one out um they'll put out the event shortly after that um and you know i i i like having a good heads up but for the most part a lot of masters athletes are ready to rock yeah. with all the events because we're all pretty well rounded and and you all train you know there's half a dozen different varieties of deadlift, but we're all pretty good at all of them. You know, like if they come crazy and say, we're going to do a truck deadlift or a frame deadlift or, you know, a partial deadlift or an axle, you know, we're usually pretty good to go on all those. Um, The pressing ones, I'm going to be nervous to have a log pressing again because 
you know, two times I've had to go under the knife from log pressing, but it's my favorite event, you know? And so it's tough. It's like that abusive ex-girlfriend. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you don't like, you don't like the dead rabbits in the kitchen, but you love the good sex. So <laughs> you, you, you think, you take the good with the bad. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, um, so, um, kind of more with the events too. Um, I guess over the years, you've probably seen, some, sorry, have seen some crazy feats of strength. If you could pick like maybe like a favorite moment or one of the most impressive events you've seen, what, what would that be? Uh, there are some cool ones. Uh, let's see. OSG uh, 2017, my first year, uh, my coach came in second to Big Z in the log press, which like, like it was like I did it, <laughs> you know. It was like, you know, he log pressed a hundred pounds more than I did that day, and that was like, I was so excited. It was like I did it. Um, let's see, what, what did I? You know, it's just so many because there's so many uh, amazing athletes. Yeah. Um, like, uh, as far as in person, like. Just on watching OSG, watching um, Lucy Unders just absolutely, or uh, Underdown just absolutely dominate the deadlift and stuff. She's a great kid. Uh, I got to hang out with her after OSG last year. Um, anytime you get to watch Andrea Thompson, uh, log press is just amazing. Um, but when you watch people like, um, oh, what's his name? Aaron. His Instagram's baby Nora, baby A Nora. So I, he's a friend of mine. I can't place his name. He just had both of, both his hips replaced like a year ago, and he's still out there pulling like eight hundred pounds. You know, when you see people that over overcome things, um, I don't know why I can't think of his name. And he's a buddy. It's a, you know you stare at people's Instagram names forever, and then you're like, they have a real name. <laughs> That's weird. Um, let's see, what what. Uh, yeah, it's it's like every competition. There's always something amazing. Yeah, you know, and and it's hard. And, and at my age, it's hard to remember all of them. You know, or any of them. Yeah, I get hit in the head a lot. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, more into meets too, or competitions. Usually about how like, how many people are usually in a competition, and like about how long do they usually run? So typically, a, a good size show they try to limit. Uh, to 100 athletes just because of the amount of time it takes for all of them to train. Um, but OSG this year, I think they had like 380. Oh, uh, nationals nationals this year, they had 642 paid athletes. Um, and they split it into a morning session and an evening session. Um, so the big contests are, are pretty amazing. And, you know, you, you spend a lot of time waiting in line to use the warm-up equipment because – when 100 people or 300 people are trying to warm up on the same two pieces of equipment, it, it makes for quite a headache. But, um, you know, some shows, like the show I did when I, when I beat the planet in Static Monsters, it was in Fairbanks, Alaska, and there were four competitors. Oh, wow. But two of us uh, beat at one of our classes for the entire planet. And so, like, it's pretty cool. Like you see some amazing stuff, even in small shows. Yeah. So I, I know Brian Shaw recently started his own show. Um, do you think that's something that'll be kind of one of the bigger shows in the sport? Or is that something you've ever thought about competing oh. in? Well, uh, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm at the age now where I can't hang with the young guys anymore. Um, and if he had a master's class, that would be okay. But right now it's, it's just the premier event for open lifters. Like I think they had uh, six guys that were thousand pound pullers <laughs> at one of the shows. And it's like, where has that ever happened? Like it's, it's, it's become the standard for open strongmen. It's like, if you can't pull, you know, mid nines to a thousand, you're not going to be competitive, Yeah, you know? And just to witness that is something I, I would love to be able to attend the Shaw Classic. Um, just to watch it, just to see that kind of history being made, you know, in that, in that room. Um, and if I know anything about Brian Shaw, I know that he has the potential to turn that into what Giants Live is in the UK. You know, he'll, he'll probably have another one and start spreading it around and he might even have different classes and stuff, but you know, he, he sold that arena out 
and you know that's that's rare for the states yeah and so he's he's an incredible showman uh the events that they pick are amazing the athletes and the characters that they get in there you know anytime anytime you see evan singleton running around screaming at people you know you know you're gonna have a good time yeah <clears throat> if you could um like kind of more talk about maybe some of the actual training days for during a prep like um whether you do okay. like some more like strength building like accessories or if it's mostly like practicing different movements or kind of how is that usually set up for you so i'm big on training how you compete um so you know when i deadlift i, I try to do what the particular deadlift is and if i don't if i have two contests that are close i'll do both like um the deadlift for pro uh, masters worlds was going to be a partial deadlift and it was going to be a, well no it was going to be an 18 inch axle deadlift one rep max but double overhand no straps so i would do that first and then immediately step over and get uh, a hold of the regular deadlift bar because osg was going to be a deadlift ladder so sometimes i would have two or three bars set up so i would start with the double overhand axle bang out a couple of reps then step over and grab on the 495 bang out a couple of reps with my straps you know so it's it's sometimes it's tricky um but on a on a typical training day like tuesdays would be um a leg day and i always trained every other day like uh, i never so the rule is never train more than two days in a row never rest more than two days in a row so it would be tuesday uh training thursday would be um like an event day for me I know a lot of people do it on the weekends, but I would do it on Thursdays. Um, and then Saturdays, I would do my heavy deadlifts and then another grip event like farmer's carry. Um, and then Sunday would be an overhead day um, where I would go through the motions with the overhead. But I tried to I tried to spread it out a little bit so that my body had time to recover. And there were some days that leg days didn't happen just because they're the expendable one and strong, yeah. you know, it, uh, and they're tough to recover from. Like if I did um, six wheel squat uh, on Tuesday, I was not ready to pull Saturday. <laughs> you know, it was, it's just, that's an age thing. You know, all the recovery, I get a massage and adjustment every week and still wasn't ready sometimes. So I knew that if I was heavy squatting, that, that would be my light deadlift week. And then a light leg day meant heavy squat the deadlifts. So it, it takes quite a bit of planning, you know. And then a lot of times you just get in the gym and your body says, we're not going heavy today. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So I, I guess more into the actual gym side of things, like obviously you need very specific equipment. Like powerlifters, we need our specialty bars and stuff like that. But yeah. a lot of gyms now will have some of those things. And But like strongman, obviously, like not every gym has stones and medleys and all that. So right. um I guess kind of going like trying to decide on a gym like if someone's trying to train for strongman how does that usually go so uh a lot of people just because um you can't really keep the lights on if you are catering to uh strongman you know most times there's only going to be a few of them in a place at a time and so most gym owners don't spend the money to cater to those kind of people I'm lucky that the guy who owns the gym that I train at was a former pro strongman, uh, Alex Whitaker. And he, he had a bright future and then tore both of his biceps at the same time, flipping a 1400 pound tire oh my God. on his second rep. He had already flipped it once That's crazy. and then he was flipping it again and tore both his biceps. And so he understands and, and he's been good counselor to have. Um, but the other gym that I train at is called Salem Power and Barbell and it's a dungeon and it's powerlifting specific he coaches down there um and he's let me bring my strongman stuff i'm like hey, everybody's welcome to use it because you can't hurt this shit yeah and if you do you're a freak and i'm not going to call you out on it <laughs> anyway <laughs> um but a lot of the stuff people end up collecting themselves like i have a whole garage full of shit and then all the stuff i've taken down there but and it's not terribly expensive you can get the titan stuff you get a Titan yoke for a few hundred bucks, get a Titan log for a few hundred bucks, get the loadable Husafeld and some farmer's handles. And that pretty much sets you up for just about everything you're going to come across, you know? 
get some Cerberus uh, sandbags, a couple of different sizes, get a couple of throwable ones, and you're all set. You know, probably less than two grand, you could have yourself decked out pretty well at home. Yeah, and I mean, the, the cool thing with Strongman, too, is it's always very creative implements. So, I mean, you can even make your own shit with just, if you can yeah. build shit, then you can make cool implements, too. And and the best service a young lifter can do is to train with junk. The shit bars, the old equipment, because if you train, like, if you train with one of those rubber kabuki deadlift bars and you show up to a, a Strongman event and you grab onto a bar... It has no knurling, it's bent, it doesn't have any give, you know, and your deadlift's going to suck, and then you're going to be like, oh, you blame the bar. Well, how much of a chump do you look like, you know, for blaming a bar? Yeah. You know, so the the important thing is, is train, like, every kind of way you can, because, one, contests change. Sometimes they don't get things shipped in time, and so they have to amend an event or sometimes someone breaks something in warmups and you have to go with something else. Like one of the years at nationals, uh, when I tore my bicep a couple of years back, um, the stones kept breaking. <laughs> and so, you know, you can't really run a, a, a fair stone because it was like a stone over, but you had to pick it up, walk it to the thing and carry it over. And they were set up closer and closer. Well, some of them were, when they would drop them over, even landing on a pad, they were cracking. Oh, shit. Well, and the odds of having the exact same size stone for more than one lane is rare. Yeah. So you have to be able to lift everything, you know, train with junk, train with the good stuff. Just make sure you're good at all of it. And then, you know, show up on game day. And if it's all like perfect brand new shit, like you see at a USS contest, then you're golden. Yeah. It's all going to move easy and it's all going to go well. You know, just prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Yeah, and like you said, you said so st with stones being your least favorite, but I guess if you had to pick like a strongman specific implement that is kind of like the most taxing on you, what would you say that would be? A heavy yoke. Yeah. When you put when you put eight, nine, a thousand pounds on your back, it crushes your soul. <laughs> like, and I believe your soul lives in between each vertebrae of your back <laughs> because it crushes you. Like, it's just you have to fight for air and a lot of times you can't completely inhale and exhale because once you exhale you can't get air back in because you're being crushed yeah so a lot of times you take that big breath of air and you got to go the distance just like <laughs> sipping it yeah. and so like a heavy yoke will do more to hurt your feelings than just about anything else that's funny <laughs> Yeah, I mean, some of the yoke you see is just insane. I mean, I've never done a heavy yoke, but I mean, I can imagine why it would be so taxing. Just the insane amount of load, plus the fact that you have to move it 150 feet or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you when you asked earlier about, you know, what are the amazing feats that you've seen? And, and I had remembered that I had a list. So Brian Shaw moved a 1,560-pound yoke, these bale totes at the Arnold, 20 feet in nine seconds, half as much time as the next closest competitor, which was half Thor Bjorns. That right there is in my top five. Big Z with his 502 log press in my top five. Big Z with his 1,155-pound Hummer tire deadlift, years before anybody came close to that, when he locked it out, and he looked over there, and then he looked over there, and then he looked back at the crowd, then put it down. Scariest shit I've ever seen. <laughs> and then uh, Derek Poundstone lifting the 515-pound man stone or um, uh, seer stone. Uh, he was doing like a Fortimus contest, and he had to beat Big Z. And Big Z had done the first three natural stones quicker, and so he had to lift that one to beat him. And he's the only human to ever do it before or since. That just blew me away. Blew me away. You know, and then Poundstone, I think, getting like eight reps with a 230-pound dumbbell like it was nothing. Switching arms at the Arnold, you know. And I've then on the that. last one, he, yeah, on the last one, he throws up the bicep. Like, that's in the top five, too. Like, those, those, those are my favorite moments. Like, I would just lose my shit if I ever saw anybody duplicate that in person. Yeah, that's awesome.
So I, I guess kind of to wrap things up, um, I'd like to ask my question about powerlifters going to their first meet, but since uh, it's a strongman episode, I was good, if you could um, give a person going to their first strongman show or maybe someone thinking about competing in strongman a word of advice, what would that be? Uh, my bit of advice would be to find uh, whoever's been with the sport the longest in your area and then ask them for advice, pick their brain, hang out with them and train with them. Because, you know, there's a lot of people who are just naturally strong and they muscle things up. And sometimes they're defying the odds by not being injured with the way they do it. So if you can find someone who's got a lot of years experience of picking things up to avoid injuries, um, and that knowledge usually comes from injuries, <laughs> you know, so if you can find some old timer to hang out with, you're going to get the best information you can. And then by all means, pace yourself. Like it takes years to evolve in this sport. Some people are gifted right out the book, you know, like, like I'm sure Mitch Hooper was working his ass off for a decade before anybody heard of him, but this dude just showed up and just dominates everything he does. He's very rare. Not everybody's going to be able to duplicate that. So find some old timer, pick his brain, do what he does, hang out with them, and then have fun. Don't go into a contest thinking you need to win to have fun. I mean, obviously winning is fun because, yeah. <laughs> you know, it just is. But anymore, I go to contests now for the after party to hang out with my buddies that I only see once or twice a year at these contests. And so you're going to make some of the best friends in your life because the whole environment the 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 community in strongman is just amazing like you'll go to a contest and someone you're going to compete against is going to give you advice you know and and when like i learned how to pick up a sandbag properly from nick best and we were competing against each other that day he's like oh you want to do it like this you want to do it like this what other sport do you find people who will give you a pointer to potentially beat them Clearly, I'm not going to beat Nick Best at anything, but, <laughs> but you know, people, they, they hand out that information, you know, and that's what I've, I, I pride myself on being a good ambassador to the sport where I'm willing to help anybody. Or if I see something blatant, it's like, look, not to be that guy, but I would love to help you, you know, maybe save your life from, you yeah. know, some stitches. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to come on. It was a pleasure having you on. And uh, I'll be sure to leave out some uh, protein shakes and Rice Krispies instead of milk and cookies this year. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, I really love the oatmeal raisin cookies with no nuts. That's, that's <laughs> number one. Awesome.